And buried in that intro was, was a, a reference to a show that I used to do on CBC Radio, and I had the great pleasure 20 years ago of meeting and interviewing uh, Randy. Um, and at that point in time, I was like hugely starstruck um, because um, I, I have to say that, you know, for, for, for my generation, a um, little, little younger than Randy, um, having the Guess Who out there um, as a Canadian rock band, uh, having BTO out there in the very hard-rocking 1970s with nobody rocking harder than BTO uh, made you uh, think a little bit about being Canadian and what Canadians could do. And that may sound a little bit grandiose for, for, for rock music, but BTO and the Guess Who and the common denominator Randy Bachman did that. Um, and I don't think it's, it's any exaggeration at all to say that when you think about Canadian popular music, when you think about Canadian rock music, you have to think about Randy's contribution. In fact, if you take Randy's contribution out of it, I don't think there's very much left because the Guess Who not only made terrific music on their own, but I think as an inspiration to subsequent generations of uh, Canadian uh, pop and rock musicians, uh, those bands have been absolutely instrumental. Uh, I have a whole long list of Randy Bachman's achievements, but I have a feeling we're probably well acquainted with them. Right now, I would just like to welcome uh, the host of uh, Vinyl Stories, Vinyl Tap, on uh, CBC Radio, the author of Vinyl Tap Stories, um, the co-founder of the legendary Guess Who, and the man who put B in BTO. Welcome, Randy Bachman. Thank you. It's really nice to hear you um, on the radio because it's very clear you're really enjoying it. And what I'd like to talk about a little bit later is how the current gig came up. But your book starts with you listening to the radio. Tell me a little bit about what radio meant to you as a kid in Winnipeg. Before TV. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, radio meant everything. I remember as a little kid, uh, you'd have dinner, have a bath, you know, a tubby uh, with your brother or something and your little rubber duck kind of thing and put on your pajamas, lay on the floor with a pillow and a, and a blanket and listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. And some of it would be funny. It would be like Fibber McGee and Molly, which my parents are listening to and we as little kids are listening to that. And then there's the real scary things like the shadow. Right. And it's the theater of the mind. It's in your mind. You create... Mm -hmm. The visual, because it's like a movie in your mind. And I never forgot that because uh, fast forward decades and decades and decades, I had out a jazz album. And for fun, I was like out there promoting it a little bit. And I got to do Stuart McLean's Vinyl yeah. um, Cafe. Yeah. And uh, I thought, you know, a couple hundred people are going to come. And we went to the Surrey Arts Center outside of Vancouver. There was like 4,000 people there. And they were lined up around the block. And there was eight-year-olds there and 80-year-olds there. And I went, this is amazing. Is this his crowd? Yeah. It's the, it's the theater of the mind. Because when he reads the stories and I listen to his show, you see the people there and you laugh and you see them, you know, in all their settings and stuff. And at the same time, I heard that... Um, Danny Finkelman, who I knew from Winnipeg, you know, was an uh, aspiring DJ back there when I was doing the television shows, yeah. Let's Go and Music Hop with the Guess Who in the 60s, uh, that he was retiring from doing Finkelman's 45s. I figured, how could, who would want to retire from playing music? Right, Because you know, yeah. I don't yeah, intend yeah, yeah. to do, to play, to retire. Either do you. I mean, this is what we do, right? Uh -huh. It's like we just keep going. And um, as a joke there, I said, you know, I, anybody can do Finkelman's gig. And the radio... <laughs> The radio, I mean, you're playing records, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the, um, the crew took note of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple of months later, Burton Cummings and I were in Toronto, who we were being inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, right. get, getting closer, a couple of months closer to uh, Danny Finkelman's retirement, which is the end of the year, Canada Day, the long weekend. And they came up to me and said, were you serious about doing a show? And I said, what, you, what, what show? Oh, re you know, replacing Danny Finkelman. And I said, oh, sure. Yeah, okay. And they said, do a demo. And I'm used to doing demos. You've know, you got to do a demo yeah. of your album before yeah. you get a record deal. So I went and I did a demo and I, I, uh, in my hotel room. And I took it back to them the, 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 that afternoon or the next day. And they took it to someone. I, and I got a call saying, would you like to do t the 10 summer shows? Yeah. Uh, the repeats. But yeah. there won't be repeats now. You can just do 10 summer shows and we'll see how it goes. 
And I thought, well, this would really be fun. So I dove into my record collection, got the name Vinyl Tap to be like Spinal Tap. You know, I wanted it to be kind of a fun kind of thing. And I called Stuart McLean and said, can I use Vinyl Tap because you've got Vinyl Cafe? And he said, yes, you have my blessing. Go ahead and do that. And it was very nice of him to do that. And then I did the 10 shows, and it was absolute fun. I think that summer I lost $600 doing the shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, amazingly enough, um, CBC had a strike. Yeah. And they called me and said, we have a strike. There's no new shows. Can we repeat your 10 summer shows over again starting September? They'll go away until October. Hey. And I said, sure, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And I just go merrily along my way. And then they called me and said, you know, we did the fall book, which is the... Um, the ratings. Hmm? Your show's number one in the ratings. And I said, is that good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know. It sounds good. Yeah. And they said, yeah, would you like to do it all year long? I said, what do you mean? A, a J-O-B? Yeah. A job? I'm a musician. You mean a job? And they said, yeah. And I thought, well, wouldn't my dad be proud? Because all my life, he goes, get a real job. Get a real job, you know? Yes, you see, but you've been singing about working your entire life, but you never really had a job, right? Exactly. It's a truth. Well, I'd have a job, but it would last, you know, a day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. An evening. My dad would get me jobs. Uh -huh. Like selling shoes at Bata Shoes or selling uh -huh. clothes at Sears Menswear. And I would go there after school and work from like 5 o'clock till 9 at night and get a check for you know, like $18, then they would take off deductions because mm -hmm. then the minimum wage was like two or three bucks an hour. Then I'd go out that night and play a gig with the guess who and get $30. And I'd go, this doesn't add up in my... Uh, this, yeah, in my yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just going to keep playing. And so, yeah. so I did. So I forgot where I started. You got a job. Me, you you have a job. You're, you're gainfully employed. See, on the radio show, this is where I play a song. Exactly. Then I, say, yeah. I get exactly. my Exactly, yeah. And there's nobody there to interrupt you. That's the other great thing about having a radio show. Um, the, the, when you were listening, though, um, it wasn't just Fibber, McGee, and Molly at the radio. No, no, no. Tell me about That's, the I'm sound. I'm glad you took me back. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, that's when I was like seven, eight, and nine. When I got to be a teenager... Um, you know, you get your own bedroom, and my aunt gave me a little thing called a rocket radio. Right. And Neil Young had one of those too, and somehow you plugged that into your plug in the wall, and that grounded it. Yep. And it was just, it was really a little rocket. It had no dials or no volume control. Mm -hmm. It had one little ear pod that you put in your ear. Mm -hmm. so you'd lift the nose on this rocket up and down. You can still buy these on eBay. Yeah. You'd lift the nose up and down, and somehow it went through a frequency thing, and you'd get a frequency. Wow. And so I would get uh, WLS in Chicago, which was playing Chicago blues and stuff, you know. And I would get WNOE in New Orleans. I'd get Wolfman Jack on a good day. And he was at that XERL or something yep. in Mexico, like 500,000 watts. And it was, hey, baby, let's rock, Wolfman yeah. Jack. And that music, like, changed my whole life. And yeah. I'd go uptown to the Little Walk between the Bay and uh, Eaton's every Saturday. And I'd see Neil Young and I'd say, you got to listen at quarter after two because they had kind of a playlist that they would repeat and uh, get your radio out and pull the, pull the nose cone up about that far because uh, there was no, we yeah. didn't know what station it yeah, was or yeah. anything. Wow, yeah. And like, like pull it up the width of a you know, guitar pick tip or not, that kind of thing. And he'd pull it up and he'd go back and say, yeah, I heard that song, it was great. And that's how we listened to the music. That was yeah. all coming from down south. Yeah. And Winnipeg being the top of the Great Plains... At night, you could just get radio stations from, like I said, Omaha, Nebraska, and Chicago, New Orleans. You'd get all this stuff, depending on the atmospheric conditions. That was old AM radio. Yeah. Uh, it was life-changing. Is that when you decided that those sounds that you heard were the sounds you wanted to make? Yeah, I had already, I had already started playing guitar at that point. I had seen Elvis on TV, and that was life-changing because I played classical violin up to that point from the age of five and a half yeah. until I was about 14 or 15 when I saw Elvis. And uh, my mother was excited that Elvis was going to be on TV. She had a couple of younger sisters who were my aunts who were also very excited. And I'll never forget my father going, hum, hum, you know, yeah. turn that thing off, it's stupid, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And they had blacked out the bottom of the screen because yeah. Elvis was shaking around and doing all these things. <laughs> and, and, and to come from Royal Conservatory violin playing like this, where if, you're, if your hand went down, the teacher would hit you with a, with a ruler to keep your elbow up because you have to keep proper posture when you're Royal Conservatory to like going crazy, like you ain't nothing but a hound dog kind of thing. I said, that's what I want to do. That's music. That's like, it's out of the box, you know, that kind of thing. And I was very lucky at that time to meet a guy named Lenny Bro, who was a year older than me, who had moved to Winnipeg. And I said, I want to learn to play that. Which is basically Chad Atkins backing yeah. up Elvis. That's how Scotty Moore played guitar. And that's what Lenny Bro did uh, 
in Winnipeg, and he taught me all that stuff, and it changed my life. I had two years there where I spent every afternoon at Lenny Bro's house. Yeah. I would go to school in the morning to get marked that I had attended school. <laughs> at lunch, I'd go to a couple of girlfriends of mine, some twins who lived about three blocks from school, because I lived way far from school to yeah. go home for lunch. There was yeah. no, no food programs in uh, West Kelowna in Winnipeg. And uh, so I'd go to their house for lunch. Their mother, mo their mother would make us lunch. They'd go back to school. I'd go knock on Lenny's door. He'd just be getting up. It'd be about one o'clock in the afternoon. He had played the night before with his family band. Right. Yeah. And I'd sit there and watch him and talk to him. And the great thing about... Um, uh, that relationship was Lenny Bro stuttered and stammered. Yeah. I had a brother who stuttered and stammered who I wrote, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet About, mm -hmm. but that taught me how to speak and converse with someone who stuttered and stammered. Yeah. It taught me an etiquette of politeness, like you never try to say their word for them, you never interrupt them, you just so calmly sit there and let them get their word out, and then they get more at ease with you, and, and then they, mm -hmm. they get over that speed bump, so, mm -hmm. so, so called. So I had this great relationship with Lenny Bro, and after that, I. Uh, in those two years, I learned every Chet Atkins album and Merle Travis, and he started to teach me Howard Roberts and Barney Kessel. Suddenly, I got an audition as the rhythm guitar in a band called Allen and the Silvertones. Uh, when the lead guitar player broke a string, I finished playing the lead. They asked me to be the lead. We recorded a song called Shake All Over. They changed our name to the Guess Who, and here I am. Yeah. It's been a blur. Yeah, and well, yeah. The, the, so Lenny Bro, um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about what he gave you musically because um, there is, there, uh, the, the incredible thing about, about in, I would notice this even before I knew a whole lot about music just listening, was that there was a versatility in the Guess, Who, Guess Who's music and in Bach Maternal Rodeye's music that, that ran the gamut from very delicate jazz licks to, you know, thunder crunching riffology. Um, so tell me a little bit about your musical influences and to, the, to what extent maybe Lenny Bro influenced that? Well, Lenny Bro at the time was mastering Chet Atkins. And if you are a guitar player, if you're just a fan, if you get an old Chet Atkins album, and I'm talking about the late 50s into the late 60s, he played instrumentals on guitar. Yeah. But it, there was yeah. no backup band. He played them all with his fingers. Yeah. And um, in order to do that, he played Broadway classics, he played bluegrass, he played rock and roll. And Chet Atkins played on Dream, Dream, Dream by the Everly Buds. Yeah. He played on some, uh, he played on Heartbreak Hotel. You know, he Amazing. played on, yeah. he was the RCA guy in Nashville, so he played rock and roll. And um, so if you learn a Chet Atkins album, you learn everything from this, or to this. Classical stuff and uh, yeah. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff Lenny would get into, and I'd go, "Oh wow, what's that? What's that?" He didn't know what any chords were called. He couldn't read music. Consequently, I never read music. I just learned the chords. Yeah. But it, like you said, it brought to the Guess Who a variation of style, because I learned to play all these styles of guitars, sure, honky-tonk, sure. which is honky-tonk piano, and the, the Broadway things, and the jazz standards, and rock and roll. And then I fell in love with Hank Marvin and you know, uh, the Shadows, uh, Cliff Richard's yeah, backup right, band, yeah. as did Neil Young. We were kind of following the yeah. same path there. And that like forged our style of guitar playing. When I play a guitar solo, even the solo and you ain't seen nothing yet, it sounds like Hank Marvin and the Shadows. And Neil Young's solo in Like a Hurricane is like Hank Marvin and the Shadows. It's a single note with the, the wang bar going away with an echo repeat on it, and that's kind of our main sound. Yeah, I mean, we need to talk now at this point a little bit more, because you, you've, you've brought the name up a few times. Uh, this Neil Young guy, who is that? <laughs> you keep mentioning him. Uh, he just came and faded in a week, yeah, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Neil's a couple of years younger than me, and... Um, a, a great thing happened in Winnipeg. There was a camaraderie there between the bands. Uh, first of all, we all used to play hockey and baseball against e each other. But this was before they had indoor rinks. So when you're playing hockey, the coach would call you and say, it snowed last night, get there an hour early. Uh. You'd actually go and be 40 below and you'd have to shovel <laughs> off the ice. Yeah where you thought the, the rink was, you know? Yeah. And uh, once we got old enough to say, this is stupid, we're freezing, uh, we all stayed indoors and started bands and learned guitars, but it was this... <laughs> <laughs> seven months of rehearsal, you know, Winnipeg winters. Uh, but everybody had a, a nice um, um, 
insulated garage or, uh, or basement full of rugs and carpets and furniture, and you would practice down there with a dream of being, you know, Elvis, Cliff Richard, the sure. Shadows, that, and later on, then Beatles and everything else. Mm. So that was a great training ground for us. But then we would go to the same community center. So even though I was from West Kelowna, I'd go play Neil Young's community center, River Heights, he'd come and play mine. So the same guys who went and played hockey or baseball against each other would then go and play each other's dance because you yeah. get boring seeing the same band each time. And Neil Young's band didn't have an amplifier. Yeah. And our band had an amplifier called the Fender Concert Amp that had two inputs, uh, two channels, but each channel had two inputs. You can plug in a microphone, two guitars, and a bass. And this was your whole thing. There was none of this. And a drum set, which you didn't mic. And you went and played a community center like this, and everybody got up and danced. So I remember Neil Young would phone Jim Cale, our bass player in the Guess Who, who had the amp, hmm? <laughs> and said... Hey, man, like, do you have a gig next Friday? And Jim would say, no. And he said, can we borrow the amp? And he would say, yeah, me and Randy will bring it down. And we would take the amp down, and we would stand at the front of the stage and watch him, watch him and the squire play and look at the amp. I mean, these amps were really, really rare. Uh, when I talk about the walk between Hudson's Bay and Eaton's, which is about three blocks on Portage yeah. Avenue in Winnipeg, every musician went and walked that every Saturday. Because in between were three or four record stores, I mean uh, music stores yeah. and record stores. Yeah. We would actually go, you can imagine guys doing this, you're 14 or 15, you've watched American Bandstand earlier that morning, like at 10 or 11, because sure. by then we got KCND, which was Channel 12 from North Dakota, we got American Bandstand. Mm. So you'd watch it and you'd see a guy playing a guitar in there, Buddy Holly or Chuck Berry or something, and you'd go downtown. I mean, somebody would call me and say, they got a Chuck Berry guitar in the window, you had Winnipeg piano, the blonde Gibson. And we'd go there and just stand and look at that guitar for like two hours. Wow. <laughs> Move and, out of my way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then go look at the side, because yeah. you know, some of them had side windows, and go look at it head on. And yeah. if you got up enough courage to go in and say, can I try that guitar? Well, they didn't want every Tom, Dick, and Randy or Neil playing the guitars. Yeah. You had to actually be able to play guitar. And after a while, I'd go in with Lenny Bro, they let me play these guitars. And this was like a big treat, because then we were buying stuff from Simpson Sears for $34, $35, yeah, right. the silver tone down electro guitars. Nobody could afford these guitars that were four and $500. Yeah. Um, I, to I think I told you in the green room, Neil Young uh, has emailed me three times in the last week. So what's the name of that store between Lowe's and Winnipeg Piano? And I'd say it's Ray Hammerton's. And uh, what was the name of that record store? And uh, what's the name of that song you taught me? And who's it's called The Hideout or The Hideout? I said it was The Hideaway by Freddie King. Here's an MP3 of it. And then I read the next day, Neil Young's doing his memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's calling me for my memories. Uh, yeah. Because he doesn't remember it. Uh, in secret, <laughs> yeah, in secret collaboration with Randy Bachman. So, uh, you join the Silvertones, the Silvertones become the expressions, right? You yes, record through, through, through all through forced name changes, because th their names were appearing on record. Right. That we had to change our names, yeah. You record Shaken All Over, which is a song from England that nobody in North America has heard yet. Nobody's right? heard it. You've heard it. Uh, the band records it. This is kind of amazing, too. The band is all standing around a single mic. One mic. One mic recording that song. With that Fender amp, yeah, well, <laughs> which, which basically mixed us. Hale's Fender amp, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And a set of drums in one room with a microphone. Yeah. And recorded it over and over and over. Chad Allen, who was the lead singer, you know, it's like February in Winnipeg, sore throat, you know, um, plugged up nose. He was so sick because we had already done a gig that night. Now it's two or three in the morning. We'd already done a gig that night. Uh, he couldn't stand up. He was taking antihistamines and he was dizzy. So we put a pillow on the floor. He laid on the floor. We hung the mic over his face. <laughs> And he laid there singing, shake it all over. <laughs> and we recorded the song five or six times and listened to it played back. And it got to be like three or four in the morning. And it was so tiring because it was a television studio. Yeah. They used to record yeah. and playing a record and hearing the DJ talk. Um, uh, one of the playbacks, he forgot to unplug the, the little patch cords that was for playback or, um, and record. He left it in, which created a loop, and suddenly on came that slapback echo. And yeah. I went, wow, that sounds like Elvis. That's yeah. like Sun Studios. Leave it. That's the take. Yeah. And that was the only... T There's three or four or five or six or ten mistakes in Shake All Over. But that take with the slap echo just gave it a magic. So we sent it into Quality Records here in Toronto. And they said, this is great. It sounds like a hit. What's the name of your band? And we didn't have a name. Because we had the Reflections and had to change that because of a song called Just Like Romeo and Juliet by the Reflections right. from um, Baltimore. 
and then we decided reflections. We'll try expressions because we wanted to be like Cliff Richard in the shadows. Right. Yeah. Sure. So we wanted you know shadow, reflection, expression. Uh, we then had expressions for two weeks. And we got a, a letter from a guy in Detroit saying I represent a band called the Detroit Expressions. You can't okay. use the name. So we said to the guys here at Quality Records, we don't have a name. And he said, Great. We want to put this out. We're just going to put out a white label that says Guess Who, and shake <laughs> and shake an all over Amazing on it. Sorry. They made 50 copies of this and sent it out, and in two weeks, it was number one across Canada. We were going, what? And even our own DJs in Winnipeg were playing this thing. Nobody knows who this band is. It's a secret band. They're called The Guess Who, and we think it's Brian Jones and Guitar from the Stones and George Harrison from the Beatles, and they couldn't put their real name on it because they'd get sued by the record. It was recorded at a party by Joe Meek. Remember, he had Telstar, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he would record everything in his bathroom, yeah. in his basement, and hallways, and there's a great <laughs> legend and myth about this song, and suddenly it's number one in, in Canada, and it makes top 20 in Billboard. We're all in high school, and... Uh, <laughs> We have no idea like re what this really means, mm -hmm. uh, except the song's going up the charts, and everyone's calling us, guess who? And you hate the name, right? We, well, Chad Allen hates it. It used to be Chad Allen and the something, Allen and the Silvertones, Chad Allen. Guess who, yeah. So he became a, 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 a no-name at that yeah. point. It became a band kind of name. Um, but we did get a call to go and play on Ed Sullivan. Uh, we didn't really hear the word if. Right. Like you can play an Ed Sullivan if your song mm -hmm. makes top 10 in Billboard. It got to 18. So when I heard Come to New York being Ed Sullivan, my name is Paul Cantor. I manage John Warwick, The Kingsman, Maxine Brown, Chuck Jackson, uh, you know, these great acts. Uh, the Crystals, the Ronettes, the Shirelles. Great. Let's go to New York. We packed up our car. It was two weeks before final exams. I, <laughs> I packed up my, my uh, cleaning out my locker. And the, the head of the economics department, I was in business administration at the time, came and said, Gee, you're cleaning out your... Uh, your locker kind of early, aren't you? And I said, I think I'm gone, going to New York. And so we went to New York. We uh, naively, from Winnipeg, drove right to the Ed Sullivan Theater, <laughs> <laughs> went and knocked on the door, yeah. <laughs> and said, Is Bob Precht here? This was Ed Sullivan's son in law uh, or, uh, who produced the show. And they said, Bob, He's in the middle of doing the show. The show's on right now. This is like Sunday night. And so we said, we'll wait for him. And he said, he's not coming out. Mm -hmm. I said, we're supposed to be on the show. And he said, who are you? <laughs> this is just a doorman. And then we went to Paul Cantor's office the next morning. And he said, oh, you didn't hear the word if? Like, if you made top 10, you'd be an asshole. But now that you're here, uh, come into the studio and play. So we went into the studio, which was Scepter Records, mm -hmm. which had Dion Warwick. And hanging around there was Burt Bacharach. Hal David in jeans and leather, black leather jacket. They just wow. graduated from Juilliard. They were like 19 or 20. Uh, Ashford and Simpson were kids who'd skip school and come and play as songs. And um, we started to record there uh, at, at Scepter Studios. We toured the, with the Kingsmen. This was the big year, Louie Louie yeah. tour, 1965. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like all those movies I saw growing up in Winnipeg, Rock Around the Clock and Don't Stop the Rock and The Girl Can't Help It. A bunch of idiots get in a bus and drive somewhere and kids show up and dance and it's a big beach party and you do it again night after night and suddenly we were doing that. It was yeah. just fantastic. It didn't, it didn't quite um, become the career making success though that you guys expected. There were a couple of years after that. But when the Guess Who comes roaring back, and it really does seem to come roaring back at that point, uh, it's got a guy attached to it doing some singing and some piano playing by the name of Burton Cummings. And there's a couple songs being heard on the radio, like These Eyes, Undone. Tell me a little bit about how you got from being turned away from the Ed Sullivan studio to becoming Canada's most successful pop act. Well, Chad Allen didn't like the loss of his name and his identity in the band. Strange. Uh, there was a great summer after the Kingsman Louie Louie tour. We got asked to back the Shirelles. Right the Crystals, the Ronettes, and we were kind of a jukebox band. That's what we played in Winnipeg. Yeah. We played the hits on the radio, and we sounded just like the records. When they heard us play, it was like magical. So we basically got in a car, uh, a couple of station wagons, and actually toured with the Ronettes and the Crystals and the Shirelles. Everything that Keith Richards wanted to do that yeah. he said in his book, yeah. I was doing it. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> I wanted to do it, but there we were doing it. And it was kind of amazing. It was the mid-60s. The race riots were going. At every concert we'd play, there'd be a fight between blacks and whites. Yeah. There was guns. There was knives. We'd get shot at going into gas stations and hotels down south. In Winnipeg, this didn't happen. Right, yeah. No, yeah. You know, when a black yeah. kid moved to Winnipeg, we thought he was great. He looked like Ray Charles or Jackie uh, Robinson yeah. or, or a black the yeah. girl would look like, you know, yeah. Diana Ross, the Supremes Down kind of thing. The guitar yeah, we just yeah. thought they were like the coolest, yeah. you know. 
And uh, to see this reverse kind of thing going on, it was really something. So Chad Allen quit the band. We got back to Winnipeg and thought, well, do we break up? Our lead singer and the, the leader of the band is gone. And while we had left Winnipeg that summer, the next band in line, the Deverons, mm -hmm. with a smart aleck punk kid named Burton Cummings, mm -hmm. became the top band. They took our spot at all the high school dances and all the community centers and stuff. And so the only thing to do would be to break up that band. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're home. We need some gigs. And I remember um, very well, it was a winter morning, and I... Um, I phoned Rhoda Cummings, Burton's mother, who had gone to school with my dad, so I kind of knew her. And I said, uh, can Burton come down to Bob Burns' office? He was the DJ at the, the mm -hmm. station we recorded Shake All Over at, and uh, have a meeting. And she said, sure. So she sent him down in a taxi, and I said, we'll pay for the taxi. Mm -hmm. And he walked in the room, and he looked at us, and I said, you've heard Chad Allen's leaving the band, and I'd like to ask you to be our new lead singer. And he said, sorry, you're too late. The, the Beatles called me last night. I'm going to Liverpool. <laughs> And he walked out. <laughs> and I said, what? <coughs> Did the Beatles really call you? And he looked around the corner because he'd walked out of the office. And he said, no, they didn't. But is this, is this real? Are you joking? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I said, he's a smart aleck punk kid. He yeah. came back with an answer right away. Sorry, the Beatles called me last night. You're too late, you know? Um, anyways, he came and he said, yeah, I got a few more gigs with the, with the Devrons, and then I'd love to join your band because you are the greatest guitar player, and Gary's the greatest drummer, and blah, blah, blah. And it's a step up. So he was, I think, 17 at the time. And... Um, he joined the band, and uh, as the spring came along in the next summer, his basically his trial by fire, because yeah. you got to start in the in the mailroom, so to speak, was us deciding to go and spend the summer in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be based in Regina, because mm -hmm. we had already played out Winnipeg, yeah. and a lot of people there hated us. We had broken up the Devrons and stolen him yes, from yeah. the lead singer, so we yeah. had to get out of town. Yeah, yeah. So we went and played the Saskatchewan. I'm talking like Weyburn, Urine, Climax, Estevan, you know, Madison Hat, Moose Jaw, Regina, all those places. It was a buck to get in the dance. If 18 people came, we got $18. and had to give 10% to the agent, and we would have 15 or $16, and we did that three or four months. But at that time, uh, we saw Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm play her first gig as Joni Mitchell. She was Joni Anderson before that. She just married Chuck Mitchell. That was a pivotal time. I wrote These Eyes there in Regina that summer. Uh, I met uh, the lady who I wrote These Eyes for, who became my wife, and we had six kids later with, with that summer. That was quite a very pivotal, wow. pitiful, pitiful, pivotal summer for us because Burton was suddenly glued to us. We, yeah. were, we, were, we needed that, you know, that paying the dues, getting in the car, driving all night long, changing the flat tires, no roadies, no crew, doing everything ourselves, setting everything up, playing three hours, getting $18, driving back to all sleep in three or four beds, uh, you know, two, three guys in a bed, huh? in, you know, in these hotel rooms at yep. that time, or sleeping in the car, doing that. You kind of got to do that. Like a team, you got to get the team together. Yeah. And uh, out of that, we started to write music. And... Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, out of that came um, These Eyes, Laughing, Undone, No Time, American Woman, and everything in between, which was some really diverse, great album music. And we basically wanted to be like the Stones or the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Every single single and song they did was different than the previous yep. one. Well, I remember driving along, you, we, you probably all remember the same thing. We're going to preview, preview the new Beatles single at 2 o'clock. And you'd set an alarm or wait for 2 o'clock. And wherever you were, you stopped work or you pulled the car over to the side of the road and they would play the new Beatles single, Paperback Writer or something like that. And it would like be world changing. It would be totally different than the previous one, yeah. which was Love Me Do or something. Like, it would totally change. And we wanted to be that exciting and that different. And so I think that led to the longevity of the guests, who was like all these different kind of songs. You compare the string of hits, like, oh, yeah. like These Eyes, a great yeah. ballad, and slightly rockier, then the jazzy Undone, then the more Buffalo Springfield No Time, and then the rock American Woman. Uh, and then even after I left, the Share the Land and Rain Dancer and, yep. and Hang On To Your Life, there was like a heavy metal song, a light song, a pop song, Follow Your Daughter Home. It's a Calypso song. It just, they just kept coming out one after another. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. To, the, the range of music is incredible, but also the, the number of hits was just absolutely amazing. I mean, the only other band that I can think of that probably in that concentrated two or three period uh, scored as many hits was Creedence Clearwater Revival. That's the only one I can think of that had that many hits as a guess who. We did a show with Creedence Clearwater in the early 1970. Right. Uh, there was three big stations in LA at the time. One was KLOS, you know, Los Angeles. And in the top 10, Creedence had six songs, we had three. <laughs> and we had a fourth one that was 12. But so in the top 12, 
we had four songs, Creedon had six. It was the greatest show in the world. We went on, did our four hits and a whole bunch of other stuff, and John Fogarty and the guys came out and played, you know, everything. Like, yeah. wow, it was really, really phenomenal rock show. And, and like you said, CCR had A and B sides. We had A and B sides, our uh, double A sides. Yeah. We had a couple of them. Yeah. And uh, it was, that was an amazing time. So, but then you left the band in 1970. Which is, which is, which, 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 which was considered... It was considered, time to franchise. Yeah, well, I mean, it was almost, it, there's <laughs> almost national ramifications of that decision, right? Because they were, you, you guys were one of the biggest bands in the world. And at the height of that fame, you left. The American Woman album single was number one. Yeah. All over the world. I had been with the band uh, nine years at that time. And as a lot of people would say, enough already. Right. Uh, we had pretty much blown it out. It was the late 60s. Um, I didn't drink or smoke or do drugs. Everybody else did. Not just in the guess who, but everybody in else. In the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>